Made possible by the Carnegie Council, the voice for ethics in international affairs. Welcome to the Carnegie Council. Today our speaker is Francis Fukuyama, and he will be discussing his new book, The Origins of Political Order. What ethical issues are raised in the formation of states and societies? We now present Stanford scholar Francis Fukuyama. We who live, uh, are privileged to live in, in rich, developed countries take the state for granted. And in fact, uh, we Americans make a profession of hating the state and complaining about it and wishing that it would go away. Uh, but in fact, it, it is non-present you know, in, in a place like Somalia. I mean, if you want to have uh, your own assault r uh, rifle or indeed RPG or tank, you, know, you should move to Somalia and uh, see uh, how much you like it there. Uh, and in fact, uh, the problem of uh, having a state as, as an institution is, is what I refer to in the, in, in the book as the problem of getting to Denmark, where Denmark is actually not a real country. It's a mythical place that's uh, non-corrupt, it's got a good government, it's responsive, it's democratic, it delivers services, and we're always trying to take a country like um, uh, uh, Somalia or Haiti or Iraq and turn it into Denmark, and it doesn't work very well, and we're always puzzled why that's the case, uh, and it's because we don't really understand how Denmark itself got to be Denmark. Uh, I actually have a, a visiting professorship at a Danish university, so I've been going to Denmark for the last several years, and let me tell you, the Danes themselves don't know how they got to be Denmark. And they started out as a tribal people, these ferocious Vikings, and now they wouldn't hurt a pussycat. And so that's a, it's a very interesting you know, uh, uh, process of, of uh, the development of political institutions. Um, so that's the problem. Uh, the, the modern political solution uh, consists of three important baskets of institutions. Uh, that's the framework for the discussion that I, I present in the book. So the first institution is the state. Uh, a state is all about power. It is the ability to concentrate power and to be able to use it uh, to enforce rules on a particular uh, territory. And in particular, a modern state is a state that is run impersonally, meaning uh, it's not the ruler just picking his cousins and in-laws and friends uh, to run uh, the state. It is recruiting uh, a bureaucracy that's based on uh, functional criteria, on talent, on merit, and uh, organizing the state in a, in a rational uh, and coherent uh, way. I believe that China was really the first world civilization. It wasn't the first to create a state because states had been created in Mesopotamia and Egypt and Mexico, other places. But it was really the first to create a modern state in the sense of having impersonal recruitment, uh, a very well-developed bureaucracy to be able to centrally manage a huge empire. Uh, and they did this in the third century BC. And I don't think that they've ever gotten uh, adequate credit for actually having achieved that degree of modernity at that early a point. And this actually saves me, I think, from a kind of Eurocentric narrative that's typical uh, in uh, Western uh, accounts of modernization, going all the way back to Karl Marx and Max Weber and some of these early uh, modernization theorists who regarded England and Western Europe as the paradigm for modernization. Um, and that every country in the world would eventually follow the path that, that uh, uh, a country like England followed. So instead of saying, well, the model is England, why are other countries different from that? Uh, I began by saying, well, here's China. They developed the first modern state. Why are other countries different from China? Why did they uh, diverge? Uh, all right, so the, the state is one institution. The second set of institutions uh, are the, uh, have to do with the rule of law. So the rule of law, as I define it in the book, is a set of rules of justice that reflect the norms of a particular society or community, but they have to be seen as superior to the will of the present government if it is to truly be the, will, the, the rule of law. If the rule of law is just whatever the emperor decides is law, that's not the rule of law. The, the rule of law has to be binding uh, on the executive authority within, uh, within the government. And then the final set of institutions is, uh, are institutions of accountability. Uh, we largely understand that today as democracy, as multi-party uh, elections, but I think that the concept of accountability is actually broader 
the first form of accountability that came out of the glorious revolution in England in the late 17th century where the king agreed that he was constitutionally uh, accountable to parliament uh, wasn't democracy because parliament at that time represented only the richest 10% of English uh, society. And furthermore, I think that procedural accountability, that is to say accountability through elections, is not the only form of accountability that's possible. It is possible to have moral accountability. And in fact, the way that Confucian education worked was to train emperors, to train princes to be responsible and to feel a certain sense of responsibility uh, towards the people that they governed. And I don't think that it's an accident that all of the existing uh, successful authoritarian modernizers are all clustered in East Asia uh, within this general Chinese uh, uh, cultural sphere of influence. So Japan at an early point, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, China itself, all of these countries uh, have had periods of rapid economic growth under authoritarian leaderships that were developmentally uh, oriented in a way that many countries in sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America or the Middle East uh, are not. And so I think you know, there is a degree of non-procedural accountability uh, involved. All right, so those are the three uh, important political institutions. The state is all about concentrating power. Uh, rule of law is about limiting power and accountability is about uh, making that power uh, responsive to citizens' uh, interests. And so modern politics is this kind of miracle where you actually have extremely powerful states that can do <coughs> a lot to coerce people, but they're limited in their ability to do that by both law and by uh, accountability. And so the question is, where does all of this uh, come from? If we begin with the state, uh, it's a kind of long-term struggle in a certain sense against the family. Uh, and the reason for this is human biology. And one of the, I guess, important points is that human beings were never isolated individuals. They were always social creatures, and the primates from which we are descended were also social creatures that had highly developed cognitive and emotional uh, characteristics that allowed them to cooperate. And there are two primary forms of biological cooperation. One is what the biologists call inclusive fitness or kin selection, which simply means that you're altruistic towards people in proportion to the number of genes you share with them, which is another, just a scientist's way of talking about nepotism, that we favor uh, genetic relatives. And the second uh, mechanism is what's called reciprocal altruism, uh, which is a version of I scratch your back, you scratch mine. We exchange favors with friends. Uh, and the thing about both kin selection and reciprocal altruism is not only are they practiced by non-human uh, 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 primates, but with any human child, you do not need to teach them these principles. They, they learn it, I mean, they, it's, it's part of their uh, um, uh, endowments uh, as human beings. And therefore, cooperating with friends and family and promoting the interests of friends and family is the default form of sociability that will insert itself no matter where. And to understand the rise of politics, in a way, you have to get away from friends and family because if you're going to create a modern state, you cannot staff it with your cousins and your in-laws and, and uh, this sort of thing. You have to establish a different kind of principle with different incentives to recruit people on the basis of talent uh, rather than either you know, a, a genetic relationship or, or friendship. Uh, and so therefore, the this, this story of the state uh, is really a story of how do you get beyond kinship. So unfortunately, uh, this principal driver in very many societies is warfare. Uh, economics by itself isn't enough to do this. Uh, all societies at one, at one point are organized uh, like you know, people in the Sunni Triangle or in Kurdistan or Afghanistan. I mean, they're organized tribally. They're, uh, they, they have social organization based on a belief that they're descended from a common ancestor. This was true of the Chinese uh, in about 1100 BC. Uh, a group of, of tribes come out of what's now Manchuria. Uh, they established the uh, Western Zhou Dynasty. Uh, at this point, there are about 3,000 different tribal entities in the Yellow River Basin. Uh, and then in a concentrated 500-year period, they fight this unbelievable series of wars that drives the formation of the first modern Chinese state. So in the spring and autumn period, they fight about 1,200 wars. In the Warring States period, they fight about 450 wars. Uh, it goes from 3,000 entities uh, at the beginning of this period down to seven in the Warring States period. 
uh, and then down to one single entity uh, at the end in 221 BC, the, 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 the western state of Qin defeats all of its six rivals and emerges as the basis for the first unified Chinese dynasty. Uh, and the war-making process is what drives state formation. Uh, first of all, you have to raise conscript armies of peasants because they can actually beat the aristocrats on chariots that had been the earliest form of Chinese warfare. But to do that, you've got to tax, you've got to do cadastral surveys, you've got to have a bureaucracy that can collect taxes, that can distribute it, uh, do the logistics for the army. Uh, and this is the point at which you begin to get impersonal recruitment, first of all, because all of the leaders, you know, relatives that are riding these chariots have all been killed off. And then you suddenly realize uh, uh, that if you hire a general, just because he's your cousin, he may not be that great a general. Uh, and it's better to hire on the basis of merit. Uh, this is something that every society has to learn painfully in the crucible of war. So, for example, Abraham Lincoln, early in the Civil War, uh, made a lot of patronage appointments, because that's how federal politics worked at that point. And you got a lot of kind of idiot politicians running armies, and they were defeated in some of the early battles in the Civil War. And it's only later that military necessity drove uh, the recruitment of people you know, based on talent. So anyhow, this is something the Chinese figured out at this very early stage in their history. You get a single Chinese state uh, emerging in the third century that is modern uh, in terms of having a rational bureaucracy. They invent the civil service exam, uh, and that um, is the basis for their uh, power. Now, that's not the only way of getting to a state and getting beyond the family. The Ottomans had this institution where every three or four years they'd send out, in effect, a group of talent scouts or football scouts into the Balkan provinces of their empire. They'd capture Christian children, take them away from their families. These were young boys between the ages of 12 and uh, 19. They'd also capture slave girls, you know, for sexual purposes for, th for these guys. But uh, the, actually, these, these, these uh, slaves were brought back to, uh, to Istanbul or to Adirne. They were not treated uh, uh, with um, indignity. And indeed, they were given the finest educations possible in the Muslim world, raised as Muslims, and then recruited to be senior civil servants and generals in the Sultan's army. And the whole point of this was to create an impersonal merit-based a bureaucracy in the face of societies that were intensely tribal. And the problem with a tribal army is, you know, at the height of the battle, you know, some tribal sheikh gets tired of fighting and says, okay, let's go home now. Uh, and this was a, you know, this was a constant problem of the early caliphs. And the only way they figured out how to solve this and to actually create a powerful military machine is to literally rip people away from their families, raise them in an artificial family, so that they would transfer their loyalties to the state instead of being still stuck in this kinship-based uh, social network. And the Ottoman Empire began to deteriorate uh, at the moment when the Janissaries, which was the, the kind of palace guard uh, made up of these slave soldiers, they began to have children, and then they began to insist that their children be able to inherit uh, uh, that status. And that was, the, you know, in a, in a sense, the beginning of the unraveling of uh, Ottoman power when a few weak sultans in the 17th century began to uh, give in to these kinds of demands. All right, so that's state formation. Um, the rule of law, as I said, the law is a, a set of rules that is superior to the will of the, um, the government. And everywhere where I think a genuine rule of law has existed, it, I think, always comes out of religion. Because religion is the only source of rules, uh, moral rules, that are not made primarily by political authorities. Uh, in every important religious tradition, they're made by a separate hierarchy of priests or judges or interpreters. So in ancient Israel, in the Christian tradition, in the world of Islam, and in Hindu India, in all of these civilizations, you have a law that is interpreted by religious authorities. And in India, the top varna, the top uh, uh, class, are, are Brahmins, who are priests. They are interpreters. Uh, of the Vedic texts, and they are superior to the Kshatriyas, the second uh, important status group that are the warriors that actually have political power. So every Raja in India has to go to a Brahmin to get sanctification. So you, the law is not something that the Kshatriya makes, it's something that the, the Brahmin is, has the power to uh, determine. And so India, right from the beginning, had a rule of law that limited political uh, power. The same thing was true of the Alama uh, and the scholars in uh, the Muslim tradition. Final 
important institution is um, accountability. Uh, and I believe that it was a kind of lucky accident that we actually have democracy uh, in the modern world because if you actually look at the process by which democratic institutions arose, it really came out of the survival of a peculiar feudal institution into modern times. That institution in England was called the Parliament, in Spain was called the Cortes, uh, in France was called sovereign courts, in Poland and Hungary called the Diet, in Russia called a Ziemski Sobor. So every medieval king had to go to these bodies to get permission uh, to raise taxes or to make important decisions. And in the late 16th and 17th centuries, a whole bunch of European monarchs decided they're going to try to be like Chinese emperors. They're going to centralize power. They're going to they were going to build centralized bureaucracies that could then project power over their whole realms without having these intermediary institutions standing in their way. So in every country, there's a big fight between the king and these estates. Uh, and only in England is the parliament sufficiently cohesive and strong to stand up to the king and basically fight him to a draw. So they actually raise an army, they fight a civil war, they cut off the head of Charles I, uh, and then they dethrone James II in the Glorious Revolution in 1688, bring in a, a, a Protestant pretender from uh, uh, Holland, uh, William of Orange, and that political settlement is the basis of modern constitutional government because in the process of this, this fight, uh, the king agrees to the principle that, uh, that, that legitimate government comes from the consent of the governed. John Locke, the philosopher, was a participant in the Glorious Revolution, and he is really... He writes the second treatise on government that establishes this principle as a means of justifying uh, basically this, uh, this dethroning of James II. Uh, and they also establish the principle that there's no taxation without uh, representation, because that's what a lot of the fight uh, was about uh, in, 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 in the Civil War. And so it's less than 100 years from those developments in England to 1776, the embedding of John Locke's principles in the American Declaration of Independence and the creation of an American Republic based on those same principles, no taxation without representation, uh, and that legitimate government arises out of consent of the governed and not the other way uh, around. And so in some sense, you know, it doesn't happen in France, it doesn't happen in Russia, it doesn't happen in Hungary or Poland, it only happens in this one country, and it leads to this mixture of these three institutions the state, law, and accountability that is extremely powerful and then becomes the basis of the building of a modern capitalist order in the years that <laughs> follow uh, the end of my book. You'll have to wait for volume two to get to, uh, 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 to that part. Just to wrap up, how is this <laughs> at all relevant to anything going on in the modern world? I think in a couple of respects. Uh, first of all, let's, let's take India versus China. Um, as emerging market uh, countries. You know, which one do you want to invest in? Well, China's big advantage is that it's authoritarian and it can make decisions in a big hurry. So those of you that have been to China recently, they've got beautiful airports, high-speed rail. Uh, they create the Three Gorges Dam, which involved moving 1.2 million people out of the floodplain. And, you know, Chinese kicked and screamed and complained, but the Chinese government just said, well, we're just going to do it, you know, so it's tough. Uh, you have to move, uh, and they build the dam, and, and they get the hydropower. India, by contrast, has something like one-fifth the amount of stored water per capita that China does because it's really hard to, for them to get big infrastructure uh, projects off the ground because it is a law-governed democracy. If you remember, Tata Motors tried to create an auto assembly plant in West Bengal a couple years ago, and they gave up finally because there's too many strikes by peasants' associations and trade unions and lawsuits and, and, and so forth. And so it's been very hard in India uh, to, you know, to actually make big decisions on infrastructure. And this is not the result of British colonialism or anything that has happened in the last you know, couple of hundred years. If you look at the longer patterns of history in both of these societies, since the third century BC, China has been a centralized, bureaucratic, authoritarian uh, regime with only a few interdynastic interruptions of that. India, by contrast, has been unified only on several fairly brief uh, occasions. And even in those cases, or under the Mughals or under the British, no government has ever been able to penetrate Indian society, uh, reorder it, uh, exert you know, extremely strong authoritarian power ever in Indian history because 
Indian society is just too strong. It's, it's, it's based, you know, it has a religious basis. The society resists this kind of exercise of political power. So it shouldn't surprise anybody that uh, you get these difference, differences in, in governance uh, up to the present moment. So democracy in India may not have specific historical roots, but there is no historical precedent for strong uh, Chinese-style authoritarian government in India. Uh, let me wrap up just with a comparison this time of China and, and the West, or, or China and a, and a law-governed democracy like the United States. So what's the difference in the overall pattern of political development? China, as I said, develops a modern state very, very early on in its history, but it never develops rule of law. China is the only world civilization that does not have rule of law, in my sense, because it never has a transcendental religion. So the Chinese always you know, proclaim law, but it's always a positive law. It's always a proclamation of the emperor. Uh, there's never a concept in China that the law is something higher than the state that should restrict what the state itself is able to do. Uh, and having established this very powerful state, they can then prevent the formation of groups that would be opposed to it, like an independent bourgeoisie in cities or a blood nobility or uh, a religious establishment. And so the fact that they go after Falun Gong today follows in a long, very consistent line of opposition uh, to the formation of any civil society, you know, source of authority that they don't, uh, they don't control. Uh, and, and so you get just the state with no uh, accountability and, and no uh, rule of law. In the West, the sequence was actually, it's oftentimes misunderstood because it begins with rule of law, then moves to the development of a strong state, and only at the end uh, do you get um, uh, institutions of accountability. So that the very process of state formation in early modern Europe is done against the background of, of law. Uh, there's this contrast I make in the book. This, my favorite ch character in Chinese history is the evil empress Wu, who lived early in the uh, sixth century. She was the only woman in Chinese dynastic history to ever s establish a dynasty under her own name as opposed to being a regent for a son or a, a husband. Uh, she did this in this extraordinarily um, uh, ruthless way. Uh, she was a concubine of the second Tang emperor. Uh, she arranged to have her own young daughter brought into the empress's presence and then smothered and then the crime was blamed on the empress who was subsequently then dethroned and then you know, a few years later cut up and stuffed in a wine vat somewhere. And uh, this um, uh, um, consort, Wu, then became the empress. Uh, she killed one of her own sons. She sequestered another one. And she actually managed to kill off a substantial part of the Tang nobility that had opposed her rise uh, to power by the, end of the, uh, by the end of the sixth century. Uh, and so, you know, the kind of internal power struggles among the elite in China were really not restricted by legal restraints on what uh, people with political power could do to other uh, elites. In Europe, by contrast, there are two big revolts, famous revolts. One was the Comunero revolt against the great Habsburg Emperor Charles V uh, in the 1520s. The other one was this uprising known as the Fronde in France against Louis XIV. Both of these are anti-monarchical revolts by elites, by aristocrats. Uh, they lose the war, and at the end, both of the, the kings pardon their, their noble uh, uh, rivals. Uh, if this had been a Chinese emperor, they would have been executed, their whole lineages would have been uh, killed off to break the rope of descent. But in Europe, there's, there were constraints. Up until the great totalitarian upheavals of the 20th century, there are very powerful constraints on what people could do in the exercise uh, of power that I think sets up the, the, the present. All right. So the, this is, the, this is the, the question we have to ask going forward into the future. The Chinese have this extremely efficient authoritarian, high quality authoritarian centralized system, no checks and balances. So if they want to do a stimulus plan or infrastructure investment, they just go ahead and do it. We, on the other hand, have an institution that has a state, but it has lots of checks and balances. And right now we are very checked and balanced. <laughs> uh, and in fact, we're so checked and balanced because of, I think, a rather dysfunctional political culture that we can't actually make decisions on impending problems that everybody can see uh, you know, rising ahead of them. Healthcare costs, the deficit, uh, the basic unsustainability of the current course that we're on. But the political system, because it emphasizes you know, uh, uh, kind of constraints on the exercise of power, uh, um, 
you know, isn't able to get through the, you know, the, the decisions that we have to make. And so the, you know, the real question is, in the future, which of these systems is going to be more sustainable uh, as we go forward? Uh, I still continue to bet on the democratic one with the checks and balances. An authoritarian system without checks and balances is a great system if you've got a good emperor in charge. And uh, if he's benevolent and does the right thing, is competent and so forth. But there's no guarantee that you're going to have a, a good emperor. Uh, and in Chinese history, you've had plenty of bad ones, beginning with this first Qin emperor that threw 400 Confucian scholars into a pit and buried them alive because he didn't like the things that they were saying about him, up until Mao Zedong, who I, th I think was regarded by the Chinese as their last bad emperor. And when you've got one of these guys in power, it's a real disaster, or gals in the case of the Empress Wu, uh, because there are no checks and balances in that system. And so therefore, there's no way of getting rid of them and no way of putting a limit on the kind of you know, damage that a bad executive uh, can do. So I continue to bet on our system uh, in the long run, uh, but it does suggest that we've got some, you know, some problems uh, uh, in the meantime, because you're never going to get to the long run unless you can get through the short run uh, first. So thank you. Thank you. We hope this program was informative and provided some perspective on the underlying ethical issues. by the Carnegie Council, the voice for ethics in international affairs. For more information, see www.carnegiecouncil.org.